welcome everyone again. This is uh, the House Healthcare Committee, and it is uh, Wednesday, March 10th, and now about 11 a.m. So we have heard testimony earlier this morning uh, from witnesses to help us understand the impact of health disparities or health disparities within the native communities of Vermont. Uh, we are going to turn shift gears. Uh, we've heard testimony from different impacted communities. And as I said earlier, we are in the process of hearing feedback about the bill H210. We are taking up, this is about H210, the health equity bill addressing health disparities with particular affected communities in Vermont. And uh, we have the opportunity today to hear from Will DeWhite, who is, uh, and I welcome you to say more if you will, uh, but is part of the coalition that helped originate the language of the bill and I believe is going to bring us some thoughts and feedback uh, on perhaps where to take the bill in next steps, given the, some of the testimony that we've heard <clears throat> and some of the suggestions that have been put forward in the course of that. So with that, Will, I'd like to turn it over to you and have you introduce yourself uh, as you wish further. Thank you, Chair Lippert, uh, and thank you, uh, House Committee on Healthcare. My name is Will DeWhite, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about H210. I am the founder of an organization called Mad Freedom, which is a human and civil rights advocacy organization uh, whose mission is to work to secure political power to end the discrimination and oppression of people based on their perceived mental state. Med Freedom envisions a world where every person, regardless of race and gender and sexuality and ableness, class and mental state, has the freedom to live their life on their own terms without coercion and with equality under the law. Uh, by training and experience, I'm an attorney uh, and a businesswoman. Uh, I was a plaintiff's trial lawyer, primarily in um, New York, California, and Massachusetts, and also uh, a management, international management consultant. And I've started businesses and run businesses. And I was also the inaugural executive director of the Center for Social Justice at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, which is my alma mater. And I was also uh, the former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, which is a uh, almost 40 year old organization here in Vermont. Um, uh, that advocates on behalf of uh, psychiatric survivors. And when I use the term psychiatric survivors, I'm referring to people who've been labeled or diagnosed with um, mental health challenges or mental illnesses. And I was the, also the inaugural chair of the Vermont Mental uh, Health Crisis Response Commission. And uh, H210, uh, with its focus on health disparities affecting based on race, ethnicity, LGBT status and disability um, is something um, that actually touches me quite personally. I guess I would be called a quadruple threat because I'm a member of all of those, uh, all of those things that this bill touches. Um, and I'll explain more about that a little later. Matt Freedom is also a member of the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, people who are discriminated against based on their perceived mental state is a very unique population of people because we cross all, all demographics. Um, we were, and I don't think any other uh, group can say that. Um, we, we're all races, all genders, all whatever. Uh, and even people who don't have uh, mental illnesses are within our, our population because they're perceived as having them. Um, and we represent all those interests. And that is why we're interested in the work of the Racial Justice Alliance because the people that, on whose behalf we advocate uh, cross so many of those, um, those, those, those issues are important to so many of our, our members. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of both Mad Freedom and as a member of the Racial Justice Alliance. Uh, as, a, as testifying on behalf of Mad Freedom, I'll express Mad Freedom's observations about the bill and in my testimony on behalf of the Racial Justice Alliance, I'll be mostly responding to testimony that we've heard about the bill and um, suggesting ways that the bill might be improved or ways that we think the bill should uh, stand on its own. Um, 
I should first say that, you know, this is not a bill, Mad Freedom does uh, support H210, but it's not a bill that I would personally um, normally, under normal circumstances, support. I'm uh, probably based on my own background, um, having started businesses and run businesses, I am very much a self-help type person. Um, and I don't believe really the government can solve all of our problems. However, I came around um, to supporting and working and drafting this bill after I saw how uh, the state of Vermont um, uh, decided to distribute the vaccines for the COVID-19. So the first uh, tier were, I think, for like, um, uh, that were not like first responders were, were uh, people who were living in nursing homes and the second tier were people who were 75 years and older. And I saw this as really a classic example of, of structural racism. And structural racism is defined in the bill. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, Vermont, I feel, has made a commitment to health equity. The Department of Health has put out, has done studies and has put out uh, bulletins about it. But notwithstanding its commitment to uh, health, health equity, including racial health equity, it still um, had a policy of distributing the, the vaccine in this way. And the reason I say it's an example of structural racism is because when you look at um, the first population that was prioritized, those living in nursing homes, nationally, 78% of nursing home residents are white. Um, and I imagine the population, that, that percentage is much greater in Vermont simply because of Vermont's um, demographics. Um, and because of both financial reasons and cultural reasons, many of the people in Vermont who were contracting uh, COVID-19 lived in multi-generational households and they lived in communities where they kept their elders in their household. So even though this policy was race neutral on its face, it had an adverse impact on uh, people who weren't white simply because of policies, practices, cultural norms in our society. And then the next batch of people who were prioritized were people who were 75 years and older. Um, nationally, the mortality rate, the average life expectancy of a black person is 75 years old. Um, and so once again, they are not prioritized. Even though the policy on its face is race neutral, just because of the history of um, how kind of more, more white people are privileged and black people are not in the society, it had a disparate impact. And if you read, I think it was in today's um, Vermont Digger, um, the state has, uh, has said, yeah, black people aren't being um, vaccinated. Um, and that's because black people didn't fall in those first two because of historical reasons. And also because black people are getting, or I'm gonna say not white people are getting the virus at lower ages. Um, and, and so I just felt, okay, given that, given that the Vermont has already expressed a commitment to this, um, but, and given that they've had this policy that really did show a classic example of structural racism, I became more interested uh, in pursuing this kind of a solution because, uh, it's not a lack of will that we're seeing, right? Vermont has already expressed an interest. I think it's just not being able to see the impact of these policies because you don't have enough people who are impacted by those policies making decisions. So for those reasons, um, I decided that a bill such as this uh, might be helpful in addressing those really more insidious types of uh, structural, the impacts of structural racism. Um, but I also wanna say that this is a very modest bill. Um, and it, it really just aims to establish an infrastructure for working to eliminate health disparities based on race, ethnicity, LGBTQ, and disability status. It's not meant to eliminate those disparities uh, in and of itself, but to provide a foundation to do this work. If Vermont were to pass this legislation, it would be the 42nd state in the United States to have enacted legislation aimed at eliminating health disparities. And so Vermont is actually very late to this this party, so to speak. Um, but I think how this could benefit Vermont uh, and Vermonters is because it would gain access, the state would gain access to federal funding um, that's available and for grants 
that are available um, that address the, limit, the elimination of health disparities. Um, right now, you know, in the United States Department of Health and Human Services, there is an Office of Minority Health that distributes grants to states. And these other states that have these offices of health equity are able to access those grants. And then uh, kind of these nonprofit organizations in those states that do this kind of work can also access that money. And I think Vermont should um, access that money um, as well to do this kind of work. Uh, so I, I think I'm now I'm just going to um, go into the particular aspects of the bill, um, kind of why they were drafted that way and respond to some of the comments uh, on the bill. So one of the first comments, like who was covered? Um, uh, there was a letter written by the National Alliance on, on Mental Illness um, that asked why the bill did not define disability. Uh, and like who's included, are people with mental health challenges included? Well, the bill didn't include a definition of disability because the, we felt like the behavioral risk factor surveillance system upon which a lot of the data in the bill is based defines disability actually too narrowly. Um, it defines disability to include anyone who reports having serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, concentrating or making decisions, hearing, seeing, dressing or bathing, or who because of a physical, mental or emotional condition has difficulty doing errands alone. Um, so that's the definition that, that generated the data uh, that's in the findings in the bill. However, um, you know, disability is, is, in practice is, is much wider than that. And the people who um, suffer discrimination and oppression and, and health equities um, comprise a, a much larger group than that. Um, and so if we were to put a definition in the bill, I would suggest that um, it, it, it just have three elements. One, recognize that both physical and mental impairments um, are included, that they substantially limit uh, one or more major life activities, um, or you're regarded as having that impairment. So this is something that I can speak to personally because I don't personally consider myself disabled, but the world treats me uh, as if I am. Um, and so I'm discriminated uh, uh, based on that. And, and suffer, you know, and, and suffer some of the ill effects uh, of, of, of that treatment. So while I would agree with NAMI that it would be helpful to have a definition in the bill, I think it does need to be broader than the statistics, uh, broader than what Vermont has used. Um, and I think it's important to make clear that it does cover both physical and, and mental limitations. So then I would move then to the findings section of the bill. I didn't hear any of the testimony that contradicted um, any of the findings. And so I'm not gonna spend any uh, time on that. Um, I, I, I think those speak for the, itself. Um, and then I'll just move then to the portion of the bill that um, proposes the creation of an office of health equity. Again, this is, this is that infrastructure that I talked about. The sole purpose of this office is to actually provide a sustainable infrastructure for supporting the work, um, work that I hope is driven by the community that's most affected. Um, but it would be, it would support the work of the commission, which we'll talk about later, and it'll be able to apply for those grants, and it'll be able to communicate with other offices within government to prevent some, like, like that circumstance I alluded to earlier in my testimony about a vaccine policy that because of structural issues has a disparate impact on, uh, uh, in this case, um, racial um, and ethnic uh, uh, minorities. And I use that only in a numerical sense. Um, there was some testimony about whether it was more important for this organization to be outside of government um, for purposes of independence and trust. I actually think it's really important to keep this, uh, this uh, health equity office in government because I do think um, it's important to educate government and to communicate with all kind of government systems. I think it would be much more uh, sustainable uh, and uh, helpful to have this 
uh, entity working within government. And then if people want to create an organization outside of government, either using grants that this, um, or that, that this position um, should, should you know, apply for and receive, I think that's helpful too. It'd be helpful for them to be working in tandem. But uh, at this juncture, I think it's really important for this infrastructure to be um, situated within state government. There's also some uh, testimony that the Department of Health um, just doesn't have the, the capacity right now to hire uh, this person who would lead this effort and also get this organization, um, this entity up and running. And that's understandable given the pandemic. Um, and so what the Racial Justice Alliance would propose is that um, you know, the bill uh, be amended to uh, uh, delay the effective date of the creation of the Office of Healthcare Equity and in its place um, charge uh, somebody with hiring a contractor, like putting out an RFP, hiring a contractor who would come in to do two primary things. The first would be to get the commission up and running and the second would be to start applying for grants uh, to support the work of the commission and to support the uh, provision in this uh, statute that allows for um, distribution of grants. Uh, and I believe that you know, the money that would have been allocated for paying the director of health equity could easily be transitioned to um, funding uh, this request for proposal to do that work. Because as I do think, I think of the, the Office of Health Equity as the, the bones of this proposal and I consider the commission its heart um, and, and mind and soul because they would be driving the process. And so I think it's really important to try to get that up and running. Um, and I don't think you need a director to do it. I think it could be done through an RFP. Um, the Health Equity Commission itself, um, it doesn't seem to be a lot of, um, or any testimony against the idea of creating this commission. What I heard uh, and read were people uh, questioning why some people weren't on it. Um, and what I would, and, and, and about unpaid labor, <laughs> um, what I would say is that the commission is really important because um, as you notice, it's, it's, it's popular, it's intended to be populated by people who are most affected. Um, and something I learned, I heard um, Madeline Kunin say, you know, uh, and I repeat it every time I have the opportunity is the people who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. Um, and so I think it's really important to have people who are familiar with what, what is stopping them achieving greater health uh, be advising the Department of, of, of Health Equity. And it's also important for people to realize that even though we've kind of lumped people together uh, under kind of race, ethnic, and LGBTQ and disability status, none of these groups either separately or, or together um, is monolithic. Uh, even within those groups, there's great diversity. And so it's really important to, um, to have a lot of different voices from a lot of people within those communities um, on this commission. Um, I think one of the more unfortunate things is this new kind of language about BIPOC because um, it's, it, it's, it, it suggests that these issues are all the same for these people. And you've heard this morning that they're, they're simply not. Um, I heard the indigenous community talk a lot about access, just financial access to healthcare. I would hear like, you know, black people also more talk about discrimination in receiving healthcare. And so I think it's really important to have as many voices on this commission as possible. But it, I think it's at the same time, it's really important to have only the voices of people who have lived experience of these, of these, um, of these challenges. One of the other things that um, the National Alliance for Mental Illness wanted was a place at the table. They want a family member uh, of adult uh, children to be on that table. And um, the Racial Justice Alliance would probably push back on that because adults can speak for themselves um, and they should speak for themselves. And the experience of family members of people with mental health challenges is very different from the experiences of those who have those challenges themselves. And I know that because for 30 years, I've been the guardian of a brother with a mental health challenge. And what I learned after having my own experience with the mental health system is just 
a great deal different from when I was advocating for him. And so I just know you it's very different and I don't want the voice on this committee to be speaking for other people. I think it's really important for people to speak for themselves. We also included to address some of the points raised by um, Don Stevens, a per diem, because we realize how difficult it is for people to do this kind of work for free. So that's why there is a per diem allocation for attending meetings. It's not meant to cover all the costs, but it is to say that we respect that this is, um, you know, there's an opportunity cost to participating here and we want to try to recognize that and, and compensate you uh, for that within the limits of a, you know, a, a public uh, a body. And, and then I'm, so then I'm going to next move to the grants for the promotion of health, health equity. Um, and I think this is really the, where, where I'm excited about, um, because it really um, is consistent with my own philosophy that people can do for themselves. Um, but th what the problem is, we don't have the same kind of access to these funds. And so that's why there's a grant in here that people can apply for to do projects that they think are most geared um, for helping themselves. Uh, you heard feedback this morning from Beverly Little Thunder that grants are really problematic for some communities, um, which is why we took great care in this bill to put in the bill the requirements for um, getting the grants because we wanted to be very transparent about it. We didn't want people going around like after like the bill was passed for people to create unreasonable grant expectations that would limit access to them. And so our purpose in putting the grant requirements in the statute was to make it very transparent and to generate feedback about whether they felt that these were too onerous um, or not, or wouldn't achieve the result that um, we set out to achieve. And I didn't hear any testimony that the grant provisions in the statute were too onerous or would not um, achieve the results that the bill is aiming to achieve. The next, the bill has wants to do some data collection for all the reasons that the Green Mountain Care Board um, suggested in its presentation on race and ethnicity data in the Green Mountain Care Board Healthcare Database. Um, in order to reduce disparities, you have to you know, detect, understand, uh, and understand them. Um, and so I, I think that's a really important provision in the bill. And I didn't hear anyone saying you, we didn't want to collect them. It was just, it's very difficult. But I believe that this bill, again, is just the very beginning of trying to um, centralize the collection of this data in order to, we can see how we're doing. Um, and finally, the, the last piece of this bill is geared towards um, medical education. And it, as written, only um, addresses the education of, of medical doctors. Um, and which, as, which we don't, <laughs> we agree is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and yes, everyone who's involved in healthcare um, needs to uh, increase their awareness of, of issues of uh, health disparities, health inequities. Um, but um, it, was, it was a challenging, it, it was challenging to write a bill that looked at all the allied professions and figured out how to um, implement or institute a continuing education requirement. So this, like I said, is a very modest bill and just a very first step. You, the committee did receive some testimony, uh, oral and written, about this medical education requirement. Um, you know, Dr. Avila suggested that it should be, you know, expanded. Um, no doubt, it needs to be um, expanded. Um, but she wasn't opposed to just the, the beginning of this. The Vermont Medical Society, on the other hand did express some opposition to a um, kind of blanket two hour um, every year training. And um, I don't disagree with um, their opposition to that because they didn't think it would be that effective. I know as an attorney, I have to do, um, you know, elimination of bias training periodically too. And, and after, you know, being a lawyer for almost 40 years, it's, it just, it, it's, you don't even pay attention, no one pays attention anymore. 
So I do think that, um, it, I think I would like to see this stay in the bill, but I'd like to also see probably a sunset on it so it can be revisited. Um, and I also think the bill could be improved in the way that the Vermont Medical Society suggested um, by including in the bill, not only UVM College of Medicine, but also um, the area health education centers and the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare. Um, but I also would also say they should be working alongside the uh, commission um, in doing this work because you know, people who don't have the lived experience of, of this don't know what they don't know. And I think it would be a really strong collaboration if we had both the UVM College of Medicine, those that the Vermont Medical Society um, su suggested in consultation with the commission, uh, coming up with some really robust and helpful uh, training programs. So that I think pretty much concludes my uh, testimony Bill. I really appreciate your attentiveness and I am available to answer questions if any of you have any. Thank you, I had to unmute myself. Thank you, thank you, Wilda. Um, uh, let, me, let me at the outset say I, I, I appreciate your uh, walking us through the bill and the different areas of the bill and um, and I, I'm just going to speak for myself at this point to say that I, I appreciate the framing of this as to, to, to point that this is, this is actually about establishing an infrastructure that would then be uh, in the position to actually take some of the substantive steps, but that this infrastructure is an, is an, is an important and necessary infrastructure to establish in order to facilitate uh, further, further steps as necessary, uh, and um, so I think I think that's a that's a helpful framing, uh, and I want to thank you for that uh, that piece. Okay, uh, I see we have some questions, and uh, again, I'm going to let's just be clear that we're uh, here to clarify and to uh, ask questions that are clarifying and not to question the presenter's information. Uh, Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Wilda, thank you very, very much for your testimony. This was the most, the, the clearest, concisest testimony about this bill that I have heard and I really appreciate it. Uh, it, it opened my eyes in a number of ways. Um, in your very beginning of the testimony, you sounded like you were skeptical of bills like this. Uh, I am also very skeptical. Tell me why I should support this bill. Well, I think it would depend on what you're, what you, what you, what you are trying. To, if you believe, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just assume you're, you're, you're a person who believes in Vermont. You're, you're yeah. doing that job because you want to um, make Vermont a better place for all Vermonters. Um, and so if I assume that's your motivation for serving as a legislator, I think this is a bill that you should support because it makes Vermont a better place for all Vermonters because it's very difficult. Um, you know, I love Vermont. Um, sometimes I think Vermont doesn't love me back. Um, because, uh, you know, I've lived all over the world and I live in Cal, I say, I, I say this, people tell me Vermont's racist. I was like, no, Vermont is no more racist than any place else. The, the way we experience racism is different. In California, the way I experienced it is like everybody just objectified me. They just assumed they knew everything about me um, based on the color of my skin. In Vermont, mostly you're ignored. Um, and I actually prefer being ignored to being objectified. However, when it comes to healthcare, being ignored can kill you, right? And so I think in this case, because this is a bill that addresses healthcare, because we all have access to healthcare, because if all Vermont is healthy, all, you know, Vermont is healthy, I think this bill can do some of that work. And that's why I think you should support it. Just because it's really hard um, in a state where, you know, that's, 90 something percent white 
to remember that not everybody is white and we all have different challenges because of that. And so I think this would make Vermont just uh, better for all Vermont, right? Because we, you don't want to, as you, you don't want to be spending more on um, other things that come from not having healthy Vermonters, right? And I think this bill could help you reduce those expenses, right? You know, if people actually had more health care, they wouldn't be running to the emergency room. That's already a saving. If people had, you know, access to some of these determinants of health care, like um, if they were saying, I need this to be healthy, right? You would be saving in other areas. And so that's why I say this is a bill that looks at health inequities for people who aren't white or people who aren't, you know, heterosexual, but it helps all of us um, in that way. That's why I think you should support it. Okay. And again, thank you for your great testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Peterson. Uh, Representative Burroughs. Hi, thank you very much for your testimony this morning, and it is still morning. Um, we do have an, an actual clarifying question, and that is- uh, uh, Good morning, <laughs> it's still morning. <laughs> thank you, um, my clarifying question is, I, I've been writing down what you've, what you've said, and uh, in the part where you were talking about um, uh, the definition of disability, you said uh, to recognize, you, you said three things. Yes. Recognize physical and mental impairment. Uh, recognize those who who are regarded as having that impairment. And what was the third thing? Um, I probably didn't say it and should have, but recognizing people who've had a history of 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 of, of those impairments because they're still um, even if you've had a history of it, you're and it, you, it's no longer an issue. It still follows you. Um, Got it. Yep, I, thank you. You're welcome. Representative Chena. Thanks, Wilda, for making time to come in today um, to testify to the healthcare committee. Um, we've, one of the, um, some of the feedback we've heard about the bill um, from the Department of Health is that um, currently they're very consumed with, um, keeping up with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and that it would be hard for them to um, take on the, the duties right now of, of hiring and managing a director of health equity and setting up an office of health equity. And we've been considering ways to keep moving that work forward, being mindful of, the, of that challenge. And um, one of the ideas that has floated around was that perhaps um, the bill could be amended to fund a position, um, whether it be the director of health equity or some precursor to that position, and have that position work with the Office of Health Equity, uh, the Office of Racial Equity, and that we would fund that position and fund that work and, and better fund that office so that the commission could be convened and that work could begin, and then there could be some kind of transition to an Office of Health Equity. And, and I know you and I have discussed this, not in this space, um, but I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about um, the Racial Justice Alliance's position about any kind of adjustment in that area. Okay, I thought I, I tried to speak with that when I said that I thought that was yeah. that you could hire a contractor to do that work, um, and 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 the. But what's really important if you want to shift it to the Office of Racial, what's it called, the Racial Equity Director's Office? Um, is that it's not an unfunded mandate, right? They already have too much. Just right, absolutely. Yeah, that office is just as busy as the Department of Health's office. And so, what you want to do is make sure that resources go with the directive to that. I I, I think that office could handle just um, sending out the RFP, RFP and fielding responses and hiring somebody. And, and then that contractor works with, you know, works almost independently to get that commission um, working is the way I understand, the way I'm proposing and the way I think the Racial Justice Alliance is also proposing it. The Racial Justice Alliance does not want to keep adding work onto the racial equity director's plate without resources going there. Um, and then 
I think I hope I'm Brian, uh, Representative Sheena, I'm responding to your question correctly because I believe it's the Racial Justice Alliance position that we hire a contractor, that it could come from the racial equity director's office to oversee that work, but that we don't just pile on to that office without giving more resources. Does that I, answer your question, yeah. Representative Sheena? Yeah, and I appreciate it. And I, I really just wanted it to be really clear and on the record that the Racial Justice Alliance has considered that compromise and that you're expressing that there's a willingness to compromise with, with mindfulness to the impact on the, the already overburdened work of the racial equity director, so. Yes, and let, let, me, let me step in if I may and say that uh, some of us have floated various ideas and I, I'm, I'm appreciating hearing that the Racial Justice Alliance's analysis is, I think, in many ways in alignment. And, and to say that to the degree that I've participated in suggesting the possibility of the Director of Racial Equity having a transitional role, uh, which is what I'm, which is what I think uh, we're all talking about, that it cannot be done unless and until, and it must be done with the, with the staffing of the Racial uh, Equity Office uh, fully uh, staffed with the positions that are in the current budget proposal and that additional resources, as you said, Will, the additional resources for this task need to follow the task that would be, uh, they, would, they would be taking on. So I, I'm in complete, I would say I'm in complete solidarity with that proposal because otherwise uh, it's, it's simply not appropriate. In fact, it's more than not appropriate, it's inappropriate. Um, so with that, let's, uh, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to field questions first from folks who haven't had a chance to speak. Uh, so Representative Page and then Representative Goldman, then Representative Peterson. Uh, thank you, Ms. White, for your testimony. And um, I guess my question is, um, and it's a concern. Um, we've discussed where this office should be or shouldn't be. And um, we've heard you know, testimony that the Department of Health is, is, is too busy with the pandemic. And I get that, okay? But um, we've also received testimony, as I recall, from the Department of Health, um, the Director of Planning Health Care Quality. And, I, I just have to wonder, I mean, if you already have this office that's, that's in charge of plans and programs and also quality, why, why aren't they doing this, I guess? And, and I suppose like, you probably don't have the answer to that, but it seems to me that's, that office should already be doing these functions without us starting up an, another office to do that. And then the other, the other issue I have, and I get it with the commission members, everybody have a seat at the table, but it seems to me that there might be too many commission, there are too many commission members. And I don't know as if I would call it a commission. I would maybe call it, oh, I don't know. You know, a commission is, is something that doesn't last for a great deal of time. It, it gets in there. It, perhaps looks at a problem, it maybe writes a report, and then it goes away. Um, so I, those are my, a couple of my concerns. And I'll just let you um, comment if you so wish. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I have to agree with you that I don't know the answer to your first question. Um, they're, they're not doing <laughs> what they're doing. Uh, they're not doing this work, um, which is, uh, and that's not a, you know, if you look at other, which I have, I've looked at the other 41 uh, states that have uh, legislation that aims to address uh, health uh, disparities. And those that have a office of health equity, it's a standalone office. There's no one kind of doing what you suggest, which doesn't mean that we can't do it. I'm not one that wants to just follow what other people are doing. I just su suggesting that, um, you know, 41 other states that not all those states have an office of health equity. They might have some other kind of legislation, but the states that do have an office of health equity, they, it's, it, it, they don't, they also have what you said, this other office and they don't, they haven't charged that other kind of entity with this work. 
they have created kind of a separate Office of Health Equity. Not all of them lodge it into the Department of Health, but I think it makes the most sense to lodge it there. So that's all I can say on that, that first question. On, on, the, on your observation about commissions, I, I would probably disagree with you just based on kind of empirical evidence because you know you, you look at commissions in Vermont, you, the, there's a women's commission that's been around forever. It's a ongoing body. Um, and there are other commissions like that. I was on one, the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. That, that's an ongoing body because there's always work to be done. Um, but I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't think your, your quarrel with this is really based on what it's called. I think you've seen there's something, I, I hear something else underneath the, the question that you're asking. Um, you talked about its size. Um, I think if you think about it as a, um, as a commission, you would be troubled by its size because it's, it seems unwieldy. I would agree with you with that. But what I envision is that they would work, you know, it's, you would have attendance problems, right? Because not everyone can come to every meeting. And they would also want to probably do their work through little work groups um, to be most effective. And I think that's a good size for that model, working through uh, work groups. Because remember, like I said, these, this group is not monolithic. They're not going to sit around a big table and agree that the issues are the same. They're going to probably be working how these problems arise, right? So, you know, I can see Indigenous people working together who are recognized, and maybe Indigenous people who aren't recognized having some other kind of work group, and, and then um, and so that's how I, and that's why I think it makes sense to have it this large, because I don't see them sitting around a big table collectively reaching decisions. I see them in small work groups solving problems. Well, I, I, thank you very much. Um, I guess I would look at it as, as maybe a board or a committee uh, for a specific um, amount of time and um, and then I guess the other question regarding this commission is, you know, how much authority are they going to actually have as, as commission members? Um, will they be able to, you know, call another department, uh, call somebody in the Department of Health and say, we want this data, you know, we would like it at such and such a time. Um, well, the way the bill is written, it is, it's written really to give them the, um, the power to do that, um, to to be, and, and what I really what I what I really wanted in the bill and what what's in the bill is that they actually have the power to to apply for grants and do their kind of own fundraising, and that's not something you see um, with a lot of commissions where they actually have the ability to raise their own funds and um, uh, accept grants. So and you know. They're, and they're charged with kind of writing a report. And so that means they're gonna to have to do some work. Um, and, and so I've tried to put um, incentives and safeguards uh, in the legislation um, to make sure they actually have some power, to make sure they have incentive, incentives to, to use that power um, and, and then report out to hold them accountable to the, the people of the state of Vermont. And, and once they write this report, will they, will they, how long will this commission last? I mean, I suppose it could last forever, right? It could last forever, but you know, that's up to you as legislators. You could, you could make it time limited or you couldn't. I, I mean, it would be great if, you know, the, the need for such a commission could go away um, soon. Um, but I always feel like legislators should revisit, um, uh, you know, if you pass legislation such as this, you should revisit it periodically to see if it's making strides. And if it's not, change it. Um, you shouldn't just say, oh, we're going to pass this and go away and never see you again. I, I think that's not prudent. Um, so, I mean, I, and I would encourage you, you know, lots of people write reports and don't, they never get read. I, I think that's not appropriate. I think that you should read the report. Um, and you should look at the data to see if this commission this, this structure has had any impact whatsoever. If you have this, if you pass this legislation and you look at data five years down the road and you've seen no budge, I think that means you gotta, you know, revisit, you know, its effectiveness. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, Representative Goldman, I'm, I'm watching the time as well. Uh, uh, Wilda has been generous with her time and uh, we also have uh, a goal of finishing. Certainly uh, we, we had said 11.45, but we're, we can take some more time. So Representative Goldman, then Representative Peterson. Thank you and, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I just want to sort of expand or understand more a little from the questions that Brian, that Representative China had asked you about sort of the structure. If we can't do it through the Department of Health and then you use the word delay and I my chest hurt. So I didn't want it to go there. Um, so you talked about hiring a contractor and I don't really have an image of what that is of like who, who, is it, who could be a contractor that could do this work meaningfully, where would the leadership come from? How does, how, what's, how does that, and, and you may not know, but I'm just trying to have a little deeper, it's maybe too weedy, but a little deeper understanding of how contractor would work. And could you give an example of who that might be? Yeah, yeah, actually this is something I can comment on. So I said before I was a, spent some of my life as a management consultant. And so um, I'm very familiar with, um, uh, entities such as this Office of Health Equity putting out a request for proposal for people who do work in this area of health disparity. So for example, if one of the witnesses you heard from, um, Dr. Avila, if she weren't at UVM, she could be a contractor. She would respond to a uh, RFP such as this. There's lots of people nationwide doing this kind of work um, and they do it both affiliated with universities or they do it independently as consultants. So what I probably should have said instead of contractor was consultant, because that might be a word that you're more familiar with. I use the word contractor because I wanted to let you know that this you're not hiring an employee. Um, you're hiring somebody for a limited amount of time to do a specific project, um, and then it's over. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Had a little mute event here, thanks. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Peterson? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Wilda, you, you mentioned 41 other states have a an Office of Health, uh, health Equity. Um, I think she is, said they've passed legislation uh, regarding health disparities, but okay. well, why don't you correct that if that's not accurate? Right, yeah, so I said that 41 other states have uh, legislation that address health um, disparities. Not all of them do it through an Office of Health Equity, but many do. Oh, okay. Well, my question is, is there empirical data in those states that shows that whatever they have established have actually had a positive effect on the health disparities? In is some states, yeah, in some states, you can see, you can see changes. Um, the, the, the states that have collected data, you can see uh, changes. I think California has, has seen some, some changes. Um, I think there's some states in the South that have seen some changes um, as a result. Well, it's, it's, I won't say as a result, but there's a correlation between establishing this office and seeing um, improvement in um, eliminating health disparities. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I, I want to raise one further point. And again, I said earlier that uh, Susanna Davis is here as listening in um, because she and her office have been mentioned on numbers of occasions as possibly involved in this and to be hearing our testimony and thinking one of, I'm going to, uh, and I know I'm also aware of the time, but uh, one of the things that Susanna, I think brought forward uh, in, that I appreciated was to name the issue of process equity as well as uh, in thinking for, about the commission's work. In the, in the current draft, the commission is, is prescribed to have three meetings per year, uh, but that we in this possible revision of this, that, that, there may, that perhaps there should not be a stated specific number of meetings. And again, uh, I just, Welcome any input on that. Or there should be something more than the three. I don't believe, I mean, I, the, the draft maybe, that I, Maybe I'm misstating what, yeah, what the I, because said, when, I, when I wrote, when I wrote this, I put down that they could, 
they would have a they could have a minimum number. There was yes, no you're, you're correct. I'm misstating. And then, it. When the, and then when Legis council got it, they limited the meetings that you could be paid for. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. But so, it, and anybody and I, we put in the bill that anybody could, you know, it, the meetings are typically called by the chair people, but um, a quorum, it said how many people could get together and say they wanted a meeting as well. Yeah, I, I, I stand corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Wilda. I appreciate your uh, joining us this morning. And I am going to call this to a close at this point. Uh, uh, Representative Peterson, is your hand up or was it left up? I think it's left up. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, we, we're all technologically uh, working to get our hands up and down and mute on and off. Um, again, thank you, Wilda, for making the time. Thank you for your input on behalf of the Alliance and for your comments as well. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Okay, and thank you, committee members. Uh, we are, so let me just say that I'm, I'm a little, um, our, our, our schedule now says uh, that we are adjourned until 15 minutes after the floor. I'm, we have scheduled a number of witnesses this afternoon and on, on the secure residential uh, proposal. And what has been suggested to me is that the floor might be a long floor today in a way that I had not anticipated. And so uh, I think we're going to need to, so I'm gonna ask of this. We may need to ask some witnesses to not be heard today, depending how long the floor goes. I, I object, you know, I don't appreciate having witnesses waiting and waiting and waiting, but that's the nature of after the floor. Um, but what I would ask of you is it would it be agreeable for us to come directly to committee after the floor rather than taking a 10 or 15 minute break in order to be respectful of any witnesses who can wait until whatever that unnamed time is? Is that I, I see a bunch of nodding heads. So, so my request, and if and if that does not work for you, I think the committee should still go ahead immediately. You know, like within five minutes, come to the committee. We'll then hear what witnesses who is available at that point in time. In the meantime, we'll be working that out with witnesses, depending how long the floor goes. Representative Donahue. Yeah, just to to mention, and Colleen can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, it, and I'm not disagreeing. We may not be able to fit everyone in, but. Um, these witnesses who were, you know, people who had written letters as opposed to organizational and so forth, they they did get a heads up that they they are more, you know, public hearing type. They they will be fairly brief, brief maybe brief. Yeah, five understand. minutes, not twenty minutes. Yes, I think that's idea. that's right. And these every 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 witness here has already sent something in writing to the committee, but we wanted to reach out and see if there was something further they wanted to add in order in order to have the breadth of of comment on the issue. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I know there's also, there's actually, there's a childcare luncheon today and there's other, other, other commitments, but I really think everyone should go outside at least for, at least for five minutes, carve out five minutes. The sunshine is glorious where I am. It's reflecting off the snow. The temperature has risen. I'll bet the sap is running. Uh, so this, this also squeeze it, squeeze in something outside and I'll see you back here five minutes after the floor. Okay. Thank you all. This has been helpful.